Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie McGrath with Forbes Breaking News. Iran earlier today fired close to 200 ballistic missiles at Israel. Here to explain this breaking development in the Middle East is Jonathan Saye. He is a research analyst at FDD. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the headline news. Iran fired roughly 200, a little less than, reports are saying about 180, ballistic missiles at Israel today. What do we know, and is the attack over at this point in time? So the first thing that we know is the regime media outlets are claiming that about 180 Fatah hypersonic missiles were launched. So. What is different about this round of attacks compared to that of April is that, number one, even though the attack seems like it is smaller um, in scale, the numbers uh, seem to be less than uh, 320. I think it was in April right now was around 180. The projectiles themselves are very different this time. So in April, most of the projectiles were, um, as well as hypersonic missiles, there were also cruise missiles, uh, short range, as well as um, drones being launched both from Iran and from neighboring countries. With this attack, what we've seen so far is that the regime is claim, claiming that these are hypersonic missiles launched from Iran. We yet don't know whether um, regime proxies in the region have also aided uh, the attack. We know Hezbollah may have launched a few. We don't know if Islamic resistance in Iraq or Houthis in Yemen have came to Tehran's aid this time around. Interesting. So what you're saying is for those who have been following the news closely since April and even before, don't pay as much attention to the headline number of missiles, but instead look at the type of missiles that were fired today? Correct. Um, depending on the type of missile, uh, Israel would activate a different um, form of anti-missile or anti-aircraft uh, defense system. So in this context, Israel would not be using the Iron Dome that it oftentimes does when it comes to rockets being launched from uh, Lebanon and therefore has to use other defense defense uh, system capabilities when it comes to hypersonic missiles, assuming regime uh, claims are actually true that these are in fact fat top missiles. Let's talk about what provoked today's attack. Earlier this week, Israel invaded southern Lebanon to attack Hezbollah. This seems connected to that. Can you talk about the, the state of relations between Israel, Iran, and Lebanon over the last day to week? The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corp, uh, effectively one of the Islamic Republic's strongest uh, military wings, stated earlier today that this was in response to not just the latest attacks in Lebanon, but, but what they highlighted, what the regime highlighted is um, Israel's targeting of Hania and Tehran, as well as um, the, the killing, of course, the target assassination of former Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, as well as other target assassinations that have taken place around the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Syria, and of course, in the capital of Iran. Um, as a whole, the regime has been more or less reluctant or has shown uh, to an extent of uh, restraint when it comes to responding to Israeli attacks. According to them, um, it was about time for them to respond and it was perhaps a more comprehensive response to multiple waves of attacks against what the regime sees as their main elements uh, in the region. But more greatly, broadly speaking, another reason perhaps the regime had this tactic in mind is that uh, in the face of their supporters, both inside Iran and in the region, uh, they had not uh, expressed or shown or followed up with the threats that they have made throughout throughout the months before. So it, 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 it also holds to an extent a propaganda campaign for their support base. We know that was the case in April. Depending on what how many casualties, if any casualties, Israelis uh, report, we can perhaps conclude that this may have been more to show face and say face in front of uh, their own supporters. I see. So this might be a messaging attack and not necessarily an escalation into a full scale war. That would depend on, like I said, the number of the ca number of casualties. But oftentimes when the strategy is to perhaps um, send a message or to perhaps use psychological warfare, oftentimes the regime, as they did in April, there are weeks and weeks of threats coming from numerous officials, different ranks, supreme leader, all the way to local RGC commanders issuing threats about, we're going to take out Israel, we're going to target Haifa or Tel Aviv. This time around, what is very different is that we did not see those uh, messages coming from the Islamic Republic's leaders. So perhaps if, if the psychological warfare 
strategy was in place, it would have been more likely for us to see more and more and perhaps weeks of rhetoric coming from Tehran. Whereas this time around, the uh, regime responded rather rapidly without issuing many, many threats. Um, we know for a fact that uh, the Supreme Leader right now is in hiding. He might be leading the Fri uh, Friday prayer uh, this weekend, but we don't know that for a fact. So this time around, it seems like their strategy is shifting a bit. Perhaps it was more targeted and they, they sought to um, eliminate more military infrastructure. That's the claim. I think we have to find out once more information comes from Israel. Reports indicate that the Israeli military has said we will choose when to prove our precise and surprising attack capabilities. That seems to be in response to questions about how they will respond to this attack. What's your take on that statement? What does that mean? We will choose when to prove our precise and surprising attack capabilities. We have to look back at how um, Israel responded to April's attacks. What they did, they launched an attack from Iraqi airspace onto an Isfahan based, which is in central, uh, central Iran, and they targeted the anti-aircraft defense system. So perhaps building off of that, Israel, Israel's rhetoric has now escalated from last time, and they said if Iran were to launch another ballistic missile attack, our response would be more, would be more firm. Now, in this context, uh, that depends on how far Israel wants to take things or whether Israel necessarily perceived this as an escalation or whether this would be an opportunity for Israel to target two main military infrastructures inside Iran. One of them, of course, being the nuclear plant, whether it's in Natanz, or as well as the S-400 that would be defending a lot of these sites and other launch uh, capabilities located perhaps in Kermanshah or other provinces inside Iran. Uh, Many analysts were claiming that Iran should not fall in the quote-unquote trap set by Israel by, uh, by attacking and by responding to Israel's uh, targeting of Iranian assets in the region. Now Israel has uh, perhaps a green light to defend itself and add to follow up with the threat it has made. So now it is an opportunity for Israel to follow up with the critical infrastructures inside Iran that pose, a, pose an exist, existential threat to Israel, the same way that Israel carried out about 1,500 strikes in southern Lebanon, perhaps probably mostly precision-guided missiles, as well as taking out key commanders. Whether the same scale of attack that we saw in Lebanon is going to occur in Iran, it seems a bit unlikely, but now the chance, the opportunity has presented itself to Israel. What is your estimation or hypothesis as to how today's attack perhaps threatens a wider conflict? What is the likelihood we see a full-scale war in the region as a result of what happened today? Depends on what, how Iran wants to leverage the ongoing escalation. Many were claiming that Iran has been showing quote unquote restraint in the recent rounds of escalation in Lebanon prior to the, today's attack to perhaps get more concessions or to get perhaps a better deal um, in case there were to be ongoing nuclear negotiations, which currently they're, they're halted. So depending on how Tehran views this strategy, they can go one or two ways. One way for them to be uh, perhaps use this as leverage, which now they have given up uh, by, by attacking Israel. So at this point, the ball is in Israel's court, in Israel, in Israel's court, and that would probably mean that um, Israel's military capabilities have so far extended beyond Iran borders, and they've targeted assets inside Iran, and this has uh, given them an opportunity to uh, to follow up with that. Now, if there were to be an Israeli strike on Iranian uh, critical nuclear infrastructure and uh, launch mm, ballistic missile launch cap uh, capabilities. That poses a question as to how Iran would respond or whether Iran would even have the capacity to respond, assuming that they have lost most of their leverage. In southern Lebanon, um, Hamas is practically uh, non-existent at this point. Uh, and if Israel were to tar strike Iranian territory and were to take out a lot of ballistic missiles, then at that point, Tehran is left without any leverage. They would, they would no longer pose a threat regionally if they were to have their nuclear program as well as all their missiles and perhaps drone manufacturing capabilities uh, perhaps more than disrupted and destroyed. Interesting. I want to pick up something you just said. You you mentioned Hamas, and you said it's it's not as much of a threat as it has been. Can you talk about where things stand in Gaza and how today's events affect the ongoing conflict there? When it comes to Gaza, my understanding is that for, um, perhaps two or three battalions still remain, as well, while most of the... Uh, 
military capabilities of Hamas has been more or less contained, to say the least. Uh, many analysts also believe that part, uh, part of the attack wave that targeted Lebanon when it came to the, um, the pager attacks and the radio attacks, that was because that was perhaps a bit premature and Israel wanted to ideally would have waited to finalize or perhaps reach a better situation in Gaza before they have opened a front up uh, in their northern front. However, some say that that information was foiled and was leaked, and Hezbollah was aware of the PGM, uh, the pager attacks, which is what led Israel to perhaps, quote unquote, prematurely uh, launch um, a new wave into Lebanon, which which effectively escalated to where we are right, right now. I think in an ideal world, perhaps Israel would not have wanted to fight two wars on its two fronts. That said, the situation in Gaza is significantly more contained than it, than it is in Lebanon. Um, Hamas's capabilities are very, very, very reduced. Currently, the only person standing that is perhaps the, the more of a strategic thinker within the Hamas's system would be Yahya Sinwar, and his days are effectively numbered as well. It's very likely for Israel to take him out similarly when the way they took out Hassan Nasrallah. So when it comes to Gaza, I think Israel feels more secure uh, if, with, with this position as opposed to Lebanon, which we have, a, we have an ongoing ground invasion as we speak. Let's talk about the response from the Americans and also the Europeans. There are reports from the U.S. military that the military helped intercept some of the missiles that were fired today. What are we hearing from the U.S.? What else are we hearing from the U.S.? And also, what are we hearing from European allies? With the latest round of escalation prior to today, um, Vice President Harris had supported uh, Israel's targeting of Hassan Nasrallah. Other U.S. officials have also expressed that uh, the infrastructure of Hezbollah should have been destroyed as it is right now uh, due to the Israeli strikes, about 1,500, I think it was within 48 hours. So overall, the, positive, the message from the United States has been relatively more positive and seems a bit more supportive. And additionally, prior to the Iranian strike today, uh, numerous U.S. officials sent messages to Tehran saying, do not escalate. Very, very firm response. Tehran chose to ignore those. Again, uh, going back to the conversation about uh, Tehran use, losing all of his leverage, and now it, it has lost all of that and had, did not listen to or adhere by any threats posed by the United States. I mean, for, and when it comes to the European Union, um, Iran has launched different operations against the European Union. Um, as outside of the missile issue, uh, the Islamic Republic's uh, malign influence and supporting different uh, criminal organizations, and as well as um, biker gangs or perhaps criminal networks in Sweden to target Israelis, American officials, Jewish communities across EU is, is its own separate issue that uh, Europeans are perhaps uh, inter contemplating different uh, ways to address it. One, one area would perhaps to be designating the RGC as a terrorist organization. Another avenue of action that many uh, both American and European officials are uh, discussing is the snapback options when it comes to Iran's nuclear capabilities uh, per the UN resolution. Now, you are a research analyst at FDD, and you've looked at the region more broadly. So maybe to zoom out a little bit, I'm curious about the, the human impact here. We're talking about militaries and military leaders involved in this conflict. But what do American audiences need to know about regular Iranian people, regular Lebanese people, Israelis. What does today's attack mean for folks on the ground? I've seen some text messages online. Folks seem like they're hiding in bomb shelters and, and scared. What, what do you know about the, the human toll here? From the Israeli standpoint, part of the reason the ground invasion of Lebanon occurred, according to Israeli officials, was that the situ situation in the north was no longer sustainable, meaning that thousands of Israelis being displaced from their homes as they were under fire by terrorist groups such as Hezbollah was no, no longer acceptable, and Israel had to change the power balance when it come, came to its northern front. Now, we know that Hezbollah, Hamas, and as well as actually Iranian officials tend to use uh, civilians as, as uh, effectively uh, shields, as, as human shields. So when it comes to, uh, for example, when Iran targeted its own airplane as it was the situation was escalating with the United States a few years ago after assassination of Qasem Soleimani, Iran officials themselves admitted that they would take out, uh, they, they actually chose to take out their own civilian passenger airplane to perhaps protect the rest of this quote-unquote uh, population by uh, avoiding a war. 
So this has, this has been the tactic by the axis of resistance in Tehran to perhaps target civilians deliberately to uh, raise concerns and raise alarms and point a finger at the quote unquote aggressor in this context being uh, Israel, previously being America. So this tactic is unfortunately likely to continue this strategy of um, exploiting civilians by uh, using them as human shields to raise concerns um, to then again leverage perhaps their media wings as well as their propaganda outlets to highlight the, the loss of life that they in fact are responsible for. Janet Saye, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insight. We, we really appreciate your time. Thank you.